that was the most stressful, most horrible and exciting and just downright crazy Friday night of my life. So much so that I have no idea how it happened but my hands went numb at some point. I bruised my hand and I had to be on restrictions at work for a day because I couldn't do my job properly for that one day. Thank you Herta for driving me absolutely bloody insane. I think I just went from like zero to 100 in literally 10 minutes during that game. Like I said, it was such a weird one that I actually slammed my hands down so hard on the uh, whatever it is, railing that it was in front of us, that I bruised my hand. I mean, you can't really see it from there, but I bruised the side of my hand. You imagine how hard it is to body search someone with your hand like that. So it's Dusseldorf, Friday night, and we're all thinking after last week's disaster, what's going to happen against a team like Cologne? Because Cologne were much improving and they slaughtered us. And Dusseldorf are also improving under their new coach, Uwe Roster. He's done a lot of good things, but I don't think anybody expected to be quite as shit as we were. Dusseldorf are an improved team. They're a lot stronger. They've got a player, Caden Cameron, came, Cameron, is that how you say it? Came back into their lineup. Eric Tommy looked very good last week. And he did exactly the same this week. It was just from start to finish the most crazy game of two halves I have ever seen in my life. And of course Dusseldorf did that. They played as a team, they were very strong and it was just... I had a bad feeling about it from the first minute and then literally, what, four minutes in? Well, from four minutes in this happens. Bit of space here. Great opportunity early on! Bit of space here for Eric Tommy, and he has targets to aim for. Four of them. Tommy still going. That is magnificent. In by Tommy. Zimmerman. He's got targets to aim for here, and Caravan. I mean, you absolutely fucking kidding me. 3-0 down at half-time last week against Cologne, we lost 5-0 at home. 3-0 down at half-time this week, you're thinking, it's going to be another one. I don't think I've ever seen a set of supporters so solemn and cold and pissed off as I did in this game at half-time. We didn't know what to do with ourselves. What are we supposed to do? We couldn't sing, we couldn't chant, we couldn't do anything because there was nothing to celebrate. And it was one of those first halves where we were like... It's, it's my mate said to me how are we three nil down when other than the goals we sort of gifted them they've done nothing because that was the truth Dusseldorf did nothing really in that first half to create any kind of threat the problem was neither did we three goals from I say three chances but it wasn't three chances and this all began with for me the lineup was dodgy at the back we had exactly what we wanted Nuri had put out 4-4-2 he put two wingers, Dodi on the right, Javira Dorison on the left. Now, that's what we wanted. We were wrong. It's what you want because it's your strongest lineup. But when you watched it, you were thinking Dodi did a little bit better than Javira Dorison. Dorison had what we call in England a complete mare. That's short for nightmare, by the way. So we had four at the back, but instead of playing a four that was our full strength, we decided not to play Platten Hart at left back. 
decide to play Jordan at left back. He is a left footed player, so it makes sense. He's played in that position before. Problem was this Jordan is so used to playing at centre back now that his judgment and positioning on the on the wing is not as good as it is in the centre. His judgment down the centre is so perfect. Instead we had Karim Rekic in there. Now whether we were trying to play an offside trap, I don't know. But about two or three times it was a long ball, caught us out, even for what happened later with the offside goal. Split down the middle. So Boyata can't cover, you know, 50 metres of space. <laughs> he needs some help. We had a weakness on the right back spot as well. Lucas Klunter was guilty of what the players keep doing at the back, which is ball watching. Jordan was not on the left where he needed to be for the second goal or rather sorry Klunter was not on the right where he needed to be on the second goal and Jordan didn't do anything wrong he just isn't as strong in that position as he would be at the centre and Reckitt can't play as a fullback so we have a problem first Dusseldorf goal the issue was a long ball now I believe it was on the right so yeah Klunter ridiculous judgment of where the hell he was he had acres of space around him uh cameron took so much time clint is quick you know he should have no problem with tracking back but he didn't he let him go and the thing is you can blame craft for bad keeping but this isn't the point thomas craft can't do anything about this and yarstein wouldn't have been able to either it's gone through his legs but he's one-on-one -on -one. he's got no support his defenders are not doing their job clinter just gets completely taken out of the equation. He's not quick enough. He doesn't judge where the ball's going. He's watching the ball. And by the time he actually realises, oh shit, there's a guy in front of me with the ball, it's too late. He's not judging the space around him and he's not judging the space around Cameron. He's judging where the ball's going to land and his judgement is flawed. He doesn't see it and he doesn't go after him afterwards. And by the time he gets there, doesn't put his challenge in quick enough. Now, if he takes Cameron out, it's a penalty, right? But it's a penalty. You've got a 50-50 chance of saving it. So, you know, there's always a chance. But he does nothing. He doesn't put a challenge in. It's the same with Nicholas Stark last week when he had John Cordoba. He did not put a challenge in until it was too late. The second goal is a good individual piece of skill from Eric Tommy, but at the same time, where's Klunter again? It's Dodi, du uh, Dodi Luca Bacchio that's marking Tommy. When he puts, when he gets that ball, he turns, cuts inside, gets it onto his right foot and curls it. Dodi tries to hold him up, but he's not a defender. He can't defend. He's an attacking player. He's not really supposed to be a winger. He's a forward, but he can play on the wing. And he can't defend it because that's not his job. And there's no one else to help him. If he puts a challenge in, he will give a penalty away. But again, where on earth is your right back? Completely drawn out of position. And you've got this problem of right playing 4-4-2. But the players have moved up. So you've got a 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. You've got two in each position. Because you've got two centre backs. The deepest. Your two fullbacks are too deep. They've come too far forward and then they're not trapped back. And then we've conceded. 2-0 down. Hmm. Then you're thinking, oh shit. Now, a 2-0 down, I think it was a 2-0 down, I think it was a 3-0 down. Because 3-0 down was right before half time. At 2-0 down, Christoph Piontek goes around Carsten Meyer, the keeper, just a dwarf. He gets round him and he gets such a tight angle that he cannot squeeze it in. Puts it round the post, or I think he hit the post. Just extremely unlucky, not his fault. But again, Piontek and Cunha causing problems, massive problems. Can't take advantage of it. And then we've got the worst piece of defending of the night. Ball comes in, it's put back across goal, into the air, controlled, fine, put into the box, and there is no one around Kamaran at all. Kraft can do nothing about it. What's he supposed to do? There's no one marking. He's completely free in the middle. No one puts a challenge in. No one actually notices that he's there. Mm -hmm. Crowded box. It was just really poor. And at this point, you're 2 0 down. So the concentration levels are down and people are just pissed off. And now you're at half time and you're thinking, shit. I had a huge problem, and I'm sorry, I love them. Dodie and Jav on those wings were, and particularly Dilrosson 
unbelievably bad. Uh, they were the two players we wanted to come back, and they were the two players that were two of the worst. They can't defend. It's not their job. Dilrosson wants to be high up the pitch and on the wing, but he's got into a mindset, it seems, and you saw this when we played Bayern or someone, maybe even Dortmund, where he was too too deep at the wrong time. He was so deep that he was sort of acting as a second left back and you're looking at him thinking why are you so deep we had another problem in that first half to Rida he literally had done what Grujic was doing during the derby which was tracking back so far that he ended up being a centre back a number six uh, that far back that deep what kind of what kind of advantage is that going to give anyone you can't have a six sitting as a number four how are they supposed to get forward and do their job? Their job is to come forwards. Dorida is supposed to be an attacking midfielder. He can't be when he's that far back. Now, Dilrosson, so many times I saw him, you know, it was away from us. It, we were uh, attacking the other goal. Ran down the wing, kept cutting inside. Now, if he'd stayed on the outside and somebody in support in the central midfield had helped him, it would have been a massive advantage. Now, he loves to, you know, weave his way through. But when he did get through, there was no one to help him anyway. But the amount of times that he was so deep and, you know, he can't be effective when he's in that position and his judgment of where he's supposed to be, his spatial uh, awareness, his spatial judgment, his the way he uses space just wasn't there. And then came half time and two changes and I didn't even know who it was. Someone told me, they messaged me and told me who it was because we got back in just as second half started and it was uh, Mittelstedt for Dilrosson and it was Wolf for Luca Bacchio. Those two changes probably saved us the game. You can take away from Alexander Nuri that he's not animated, that he looks so solemn, that he just looks con like a condemned man, but you have to say that the two changes he made in that interval changed everything he knew what was wrong he saw what we saw which was the problem on the wing too much space for Dusseldorf on the break put into defensive wingers that can play wing back and attack was a very very clever move what you've now got is Wolf and Maxi in a position to attack but also if they lose the ball or someone loses the ball they will track back. It was literally like having a potential six at the back, two centre backs, two full backs, and then two wing backs. It meant covering more ground. And mm -hmm. Maxi and, and Klunter, uh, not Klunter, Maxi and Wolf, uh, Wolf in particular, his attacking awareness was great. And if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have even scored the second goal. First goal of the comeback came back in 60 minutes and around 60 minutes or 65 and it was uh, as someone said determination from Dorida now the ball was lobbed forward someone noticed the run of Dorida no one was really tracking it but he was pretty quick you know quicker than what people would expect him to be he's run on as like a number 10 so his position if you look at it has changed usually we've got this problem of the forwards too high and the midfielders too deep with a massive gap in the middle. What Derrida ended up doing in the second half was filling that gap. His shell bread was where it was supposed to be, central mid defensive midfield. Derrida moved higher up the pitch. The higher up the pitch he got, the better it was for him. That ball that came over that was lobbed over, he just ran onto it. And all he did was notice that Piontek was in the middle in the penalty area, but Piontek was on the far po uh, on the near post, pretty much on the line of the six yard box he was very very much in the corner would never have been able to really control it but there was the awareness that he was there from Piontek being there you know you can see him trying a header in doesn't work but the distraction for Tommy who's in the middle is that he distracts Eric Tommy to the point that he actually puts it in his own net it's an own goal but who gives a shit <laughs> Got an own goal. Now work hard. I just remember screaming, okay, now fight. Now you bloody well fight. And that's what they did. They did fight because but three minutes later, it was a counter-attack. It was a good it wasn't a good clearance, it was more like a oh get it away, but they got it away on the ground. Now from quick 
you know, quick countering. This is one of the first times I've ever seen her to counter this quickly this season. Shellbread gives it to Wolf. Wolf runs into so much space. Now, he's quick, but the thing is about him is that it's not just because he's fast. He's very powerful, very difficult to stop. Big guy, very strong. And I criticised Wolf last week for being a wingback, right wingback, but I always said he can see what's in front of him. His awareness in front of him is great. It's what's behind him that he can't do. So as a winger, he's way more effective. So use him there. On that moment, it was pretty much all Hertha. There was a few Dusseldorf counters, but they were dealt with fine because of Maximilian Mittelstedt and Marius Wolf being in those positions they were in. It was easier. I mean, it got to a point where Jordan Turunariga actually ended up being a left winger. He was making runs down the left. He was really quick. He's quite skilled. Also, it meant that the, de uh, the, the higher up the pitch he was, he could win the ball back quickly. And he knew he was going to be covered by Mittelstedt because Mittelstedt can play left back as well. So they were inter interchanging with each other. It was just one of these really weird things. And the positioning of the players was far better than anything we did last week. Far better than anything really we've done this season. There's this gap in the middle, but it's sort of now being plugged. People are in the right positions. People are noticing where the spaces are. And then Dusseldorf, they put five on when I got to 3-2 to try and stop us coming forward to try and actually hold on to their lead, even though it was now cut to one goal. And it, even then, it completely failed. They couldn't handle Cunha. They couldn't handle Piontek, who was too quick for them. They couldn't handle how quick we were coming forwards. And then, of course, Piontek gets the ball from Mateus Cunha in the 75th minute, goes into the box, and then Kastamaya brings him down. And originally, I think the commentators said that they thought Kastamaya got the ball. No, 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 no. My friends, my friends, we were there. Kastamaya got nowhere near the ball. Piontek touched it away with his right foot, his left foot, can't even remember. If he had not touched him and Piontek had gone round him, he would have put that in because he took it wide, but not so far wide he couldn't hit it like before. He would have put that in. Now, Kastenmeier's come out, he's made no contact with the ball and he's absolutely wiped him out. And who should take the penalty but the man that went down? Now you're thinking, shit. Under pressure penalty. We're going to miss this. Except this is what happens. <laughs> He's gonna miss it! He's gonna miss it! Absolute limbs ah. No, I'm not even kidding. I was crying at the end of this game. I was I could not believe what I was seeing and the worst thing is We could have won it Not only did we play better than Dusseldorf our hearts and our mouths at one point because Dusseldorf scored again and I thought You're kidding me. We have just come from 3-0 down and now we're gonna lose Because Dusseldorf was shit pretty much throughout the entire game, but we still ended up being 3-0 down we were just the shit, that's the problem. We couldn't defend. We couldn't get the ball forwards because our positioning was wrong. It was just that those half-time changes that were made put Dusseldorf on the back foot from the very start of the second half because we were now coming forwards and it all came down really to a speech. So apparently what happened at half-time, according to Nuri and other players, was that Thomas Kraft, the goalkeeper for that day, because Rooney Arstein was benched, actually was just furious with what he had seen in that first half. Not only was he furious, he knew that he had to say something about it because if somebody didn't, they would lose again 5-0. And apparently his words were something along the line of, do you want to get slaughtered again or do you want to go out there and fight and actually look like you care? And he was just, I don't know if he was angry or if he just said something inspirational or something, but at that moment, especially after the first goal went in, Everyone's attitude changed. They now believe that we're actually capable of something. You could see it in the players, especially after the second one. They knew it. They could smell blood. And then, of course, after that Dusseldorf offside goal went in, I was thinking, oh, fuck. My friend pointed at the offside flag. I was like, please, please. VAR came up. I was thinking, please let this be offside. It was. Now, it was weird because the linesman put his flag up, so it was quite, it would say it was quite clear it was offside when you watch it back. It wasn't marginal, but it was. It wasn't clear, but it wasn't marginal. It was offside, but it was one of those ones of you can see it when you s slow it down and look at it. If the linesman's seen that, his eyes must be amazing. <laughs> you know, we're then thinking, 
Mm, okay. It's luck. We got a little bit of luck. We had no goal. We had a they had a goal disallowed, and then of course in the ninety first minute we didn't have the luck. Cunha got the ball on the edge of the box, hit it. It smashed off the outside of the post. Now it wasn't just that, but we were creating chances like not half chances not like you know oh my god he saved it Castamaya did make a few good saves Thomas Kraft made a good save in the second half as well which kept us in it but it was more of a thing where we were coming forwards getting the ball in the box and just not getting the shot away it was getting blocked or the passes were being cleared or they were being uh, headed away when they were in the air it's one of those things of we're creating and dominating but we're not putting the ball in <laughs> but to score three goals to come from three nil down everyone was thinking we should win this game you know in the last minute when we hit the post and thinking oh just so damn close it was just one of those very very odd games of watching it and thinking from the first half oh fuck we're going down to holy shit we might actually win this and from a three goal disadvantage, you're looking at a lot of determination and confidence and just, you know, to be three nil down, you must feel like absolute shit, but that's kind of the way they were playing, so they deserved it. But they didn't deserve to be three nil down because Dusseldorf hadn't really done anything. They, they weren't dominating, Dusseldorf were three nil up, they weren't even dominating, it was just one of those things where you have three chances, you score three goals and you just have to do that. And they must have been like you know celebrating half time thinking jesus christ how many can we get they didn't expect thomas craft to have a, a, a shit show in the in the dressing room and you know sort of have a ferguson moment <laughs> of berating the players and then for all of a sudden us to sort of pop back but from the moment we came out there was something different about that side there was a, attacking football coming in and okay one of the issues we have was they are still misplaced passes in there some pretty bad still trying to play it out from the back sometimes where you shouldn't, but the thing is, it's better to play out from the back on the floor because you create more, but it risks you losing the ball in a bad place, and, you know, that was annoying to watch, but at the end of the day, it didn't come to anything, so it was fine. A better team would probably punish us for it, but when you look at it back, we dominated that second half. We should have won it. We had, apparently, like, something happened. What was, now, what was the percentage? That was it. So apparently in 20 minute period, we had made 71% successful challenges. Dusseldorf made 29%. They were struggling and they were on the back foot. And when you think if we had been, if we had been a tiny bit more clinical and not panicking because we were three, two down at that point, thinking they were probably thinking, oh my God, we might actually do this. They didn't panic up front, but at the back they kind of did. Even the offside goal, though, split the defence. And that is something that's got to stop. Whether we were trying to play an offside trap, I don't know. But we cannot mm -hmm. afford to do that. We cannot afford to let this defence get split. We have to be more aware of what's around us. We have to go to Bremen next. And interesting about Bremen, their game was cancelled on Sunday because Frankfurt's game in the Europa League was rescheduled for the Friday because there was a storm in Salzburg. They played um, RB, RB Salzburg. <sighs> Red Bull Salzburg. They played Red Bull Salzburg. They played Red Bull Salzburg and uh, Frankfurt had to play on Friday. They couldn't play on Sunday because then they have a DFB Cup game on Wednesday, again against Bremen. Now, Bremen have to play that away. And apparently now they are going to travel straight from Frankfurt to Berlin because they can't go back to Bremen. It's a bit weird because they're going to be absolutely knackered. <sighs> they are going to be tired. That is our advantage. But if they had played that game on Sunday, it would have been Bremen's advantage because Frankfurt would have had no time to recover from the Europa League match. So you've got Bremen missing out on a game, now have it in hand. They don't know when they're going to play it. You've got Frankfurt playing them on Wednesday and Bremen can't go home to Bremen to actually trade or rest. They have to go straight to Berlin. Travelling on probably the Friday, they are going to be shattered. They are not training in their own facilities on the Thursday unless they have a day off. They can't work on anything. 
it's a very, very tight schedule for him, and that is going to only work to my advantage. And to me, there is no excuse to lose that game because Bremen this year, despite having a decent side, they've been awful, even worse than us. You look at their defence and you think, what is happening here? David Klaassen's a decent player. You've got players like Rashica. Now, is either hot or cold. He's good or he's bad. Sometimes he just can't do what he wants to do. Selka can't play. He's banned against us because it was in his contract. He didn't say anything else about it. Very mature in his press conference. I liked the way he handled it. Basically saying, you're not going to get an answer out of me when he was asked about why can't you play against Hertha. Basically said, it's in my contract, otherwise I couldn't have come back. That's all I'm going to say. It's very nicely done. You know, Bremen have some good players, but they... You know, if Dusseldorf can take advantage of our defensive errors, don't think that Bremen can't. We have not beaten Bremen in something like over a decade, maybe even two. Last season, we were extremely close to beating them at home and we drew 1-1 because Claudio Pizarro scored a free kick in the last minute. <laughs> that said, it could have been worse. It could have been Matt Cruiser and he's an asshole apparently, so nobody likes him. But at least it was someone that we like, Pizarro. Everyone loves a bit of pizza. Except for when he scores in the last minute. We don't like that very much. You know, I've said we haven't beaten Bremen in a very long time. I haven't seen Werder Bremen be this bad in a very long time. Uh, <laughs> you know, they they beat Dortmund in the cup, but everything changes in the cup. Everything changes. Everyone's pressures are gone. Playing in the league is very, very different. And for me, there's no excuse to make the same mistakes we keep making in every game against Bremen as well. Because whether they can take advantage of them, we don't know. They play good football sometimes. So did Dusseldorf, so did Mainz, so did Paderborn, so did Cologne. Every team plays good football at points. They have to take advantage of our weakness. For me, it starts with putting Jordan back in that central defensive role. Oh yeah, and please don't put Niklas Stark back into the team because, uh, as you can see, he's really not needed. At the end of that game, the fans and the players came together and it was Ibizovic, I think, Ibizovic, Dorida, Klunter... Mittelstedt and Wolf, they all came over to the supporters. Shellbread as well. The reaction was the complete opposite of how it was against Cologne when they didn't even bother. It was a captain's reaction from, guess who? Vedad. Whether he's playing or not, he still had that reaction. And apparently what was said was something along mm -hmm. the lines of, I understand how frustrated you are, but please know we did everything we could tonight to win this game. And you could see that. It's the most I've seen the team fight like this all season. But when it comes to playing teams like Bremen, it's going to be hard because obviously we're nine points, or no, we're ten points ahead of them, but they've got a game in hand. We are still nine points ahead of them. And if Nuri can't beat them, it's his ex-team. If we can't beat them, he's gone. And I'm sorry, Michel Pritz, but you've got no choice. You'll have to bring in someone that's still re related close to the club. And the only person that's going to be related close to the club is Paul Dardo. So might as well just swallow your damn pride and do something now. Ah, uh, Bremen, Bremen, Bremen. What do I think about them? I love them. I like Bremen. But I'd rather us not go down. And a lot of people have said, you've got too much quality to go down, and Bremen haven't, and Paderborn haven't, and Dusseldorf haven't. We are now 10 points ahead of Bremen with the game in hand. If they won that, then we would be 7 points ahead of them. If they beat us, then we would be 7 points ahead of them. If they won another mm -hmm. one, they would be 1 point. We have to win against them, because think about the fact that they could win against Frankfurt, but that's a hard game. They've also got Gladbach, they've got Bayern coming up, they've got Cologne, I think. They've got so many difficult teams. We have got Hoffenheim, Union, Augsburg, and then we've got some really difficult ones ourselves. The importance of this game is huge. If we don't get at least a point, we could be still in trouble. That said, we said that at the end of last year. We kind of won most of them. I think the problem is here, everyone dislikes Klinsman for what he did. The problem is, whether you like it or not, his mouth, he was the mouthpiece. And Nuri is not a talker. Which is why he needed the team to motivate themselves. Thomas Kraft had to say something. Because Nuri can't. The scene at the end of the game where they were talking to each other. Nuri can't do that. It's not who he is. He's a tactical guy. And he made the changes that needed to be made. And he did the right thing. However, he didn't do what was needed, which was to basically scream at everyone to motivate them. But Klinsman, in a way, did do that. But now we've got players doing it themselves. And I think they've realised that if they don't do something, they are in a lot of trouble. 
and we saw something we have not seen in a long time, which was motivation. And then it came out like that. It's just very, very, very strange experience in Dusseldorf. <laughs> One last thing that happened this weekend was probably the protests against Dietmar Hopp. Now, if anyone doesn't know, Dietmar Hopp is a German businessman that grew up, or uh, I believe grew up around Zinzheim, which is where Hoffenheim are from. He played for their youth setup. He's very involved and has been for a very long time. Very successful businessman, and he is exempt from 50 plus 1 rule because he's been involved with Hoffenheim for a very long time. People have been releasing banners uh, about him and disliking his exemption from the 50 plus 1 rule for a while. They don't like it. Martin Kind from Hanover actually tried to do the same thing and was denied. And obviously the only other two clubs other than Hoffenheim to have this exemption is our Wolfsburg, uh, of which were um, they played Union yesterday, and Union bottled it, by the way. They were 2-0 up, they uh, drew 2-2. And although we did that against Frankfurt, it was kind of different because we didn't deserve to be 2-0 up. Or well, then again, Union didn't deserve to be 2-0 up either. Wolfsburg should have won that game. But Wolfsburg and Bayer Leverkusen are both exempt because of the um, creation of their clubs a very long time ago by the pharmaceutical buyer in Leverkusen and Volkswagen in Wolfsburg. So it made sense. Hop was a bit different. He wasn't a company. He's a person. So, yeah, being exempt, he pumped in loads of money to Hoffenheim, took them from the fifth division to the Bundesliga, done a lot of work. Zinzheim is a, a village. When you see Hoffenheim away games, you see how the, the whole village has turned up. There's literally about... 50 people, something like that. Anyway, people were protesting against him and they've called him a son of a whore for a very long time. But now the DFB and the referees and officials, they're all taking action against this aggressive behaviour. And okay, abusive language is not nice. But Dietmar Hopp is a businessman who has done something that is not well liked and well regarded in Germany against their 50 plus 1. A lot of fans are very much in favour of keeping 50 plus 1. Dietmar Hopp does not want to. He had to expect some backlash from it. He had to expect dislike. He's been getting it for a long time. Now, people have been like putting pictures of him in crosshairs. They've been calling him a son of a whore with these banners. Now, that it's being classed as hate speech. But for me, hate speech is when you hate put hateful speech up against someone for something that they can't change. Dietmar Hopp chose to go against 50 plus 1. He chose to be a businessman and pump money into Hoffenheim. You know, Jordan Turinariga didn't choose to be black. You know, um, there are people that don't choose to be gay. There are players that don't choose to be Muslim. They were born into a Muslim family. Racism and sexism and homophobia are still part of unfortunately part of the stadium atmosphere sometimes and there is nothing being done. Now, why is it that the DFB are acting now when a businessman is just slightly offended by the language being used? And I'm not saying it's correct language and it's nice because it's not. And it's not acceptable to be abusive to someone. But why are they standing up for a, you know, a wealthy owner, a billionaire, taking players off the pitch, doing this, threatening to you know uh, call the game off? But they're not doing the same for when homophobic banners appear or for when people make monkey noises why is it only when an offensive well not even hugely offensive banner comes up why why is it you're more interested in protecting a billionaire than you are a man because of the color of his skin is it because Dietmar hops white and privileged that he's getting an exception i don't get it you know jordan turinariga was left in tears against schalke a few weeks ago Gelsenkirchen because of the racist abuse he suffered. Nobody did anything and the excuse was that the referee couldn't hear it so he couldn't do it. It's rubbish. But when something happens to a businessman, wealthy man, wealthy white man, privileged white man, yeah, everything goes and kicks off. Now I'm not saying it's, it's right for people to do that. You know, The players have every right to go around to their fans and say please take that down. But you know the fans for instance... <laughs> The Bayern fans didn't go the right way about it, particularly with the words they use, with the what they did, because it resurfaced. If you're going to use it, use it once and then take it down. You know, you put your point across. Bringing it back just causes a problem. 
and I understand they're trying to make a point. But now the point's been made, you you should just let it go and just see what the DFB do. Dortmunds have a, had a collective punishment because of their protest against Hop, and it's unfair. You cannot collectively punish a set of fans because a few fans are being, you know, mouthy. Doesn't make any sense. Collective punishments, they only ever work in the in the regards of racism because for instance Schalke should have had a collective punishment for the racism incident because it's not the first time it's happened and it seems that it's it's a thing that's been going for a long time and because of um Turney's being involved with Schalke still making the racist comments he made it makes every sense to punish collectively take something away from the club and prove that you're actually serious take points away take victories away that might actually you know convince those idiot supporters that they're actually damaging their club because if you just get rid of one person another person's going to come and take their place but i still don't understand why the dfb are not acting against other forms of uh, aggression and other forms of just horrible behavior like racism homophobia and in the game between union berlin and um Wolfsburg yesterday in Köpenick, you know the banner resurfaced it came up and then it resurfaced with the same words and you know the Union fans the players were trying to convince the fans to take it down but this is where it gets stupid because to me Union fans saw what happened in Hoffenheim between Hoffenheim and Bayern and yet they decided to do it anyway and they knew the consequences of doing it and what it could risk they knew it could risk their team forfeiting a match because it's their fans that did it and yet they did it anyway you know, maybe they didn't do it a third time because they knew the game would be abandoned, but they did it anyway. That's just really, really stupid. Um, and yet, at the same time, it's hypocritical of Union fans to say such a thing because in the derby, and I saw it because I was there, they held up a banner that could be, under some context and pretext, seen as homophobic. That banner was not taken down. That banner was not protested against. That banner was not looked at by the referee they did nothing there was not even a fine for it the dfb didn't react when jordan turin Ariga reported racism to the referee they didn't react um what's going on here you know the hypocrisy is ridiculous not just from the dfb but some fans as well there's a racism problem in germany there's a racism mm -hmm. problem in the world and you know there's there's a horrible there's a horrible sort of what's the word, epidemic of racism and, and, and homophobia and xenophobia going around and yet we're all now looking at this businessman getting more attention because some fans don't like the fact that he owns a club and they called him a son of a bitch. Which, in my eyes, I hear that sentence every day just from random people. You know, I hear it on TV, I, I don't take offence to that, I just think, whatever, fuck you. Get on with my life. But if someone turns around and does something racist, you can't. You cannot accept that. But it's being accepted. And the only time anyone ever turns around and, and says anything is when a fucking millionaire gets upset. And I think it's just tragic. It's horrible. It's a disgusting way to deal with something. If that's the way the DFB is going to deal with abusive language, then maybe they should take a look in the mirror and start fucking doing something about things that really matter. Like racism. Because if they don't, it's just going to keep happening. The worst thing is this. Imagine after two weeks, three weeks, seeing that happen against Hoffenheim between Union and Wolfsburg, getting the game taken off the reaction. Imagine how Jordan Turunariga is feeling right now. He is probably thinking to himself, they could do this for a white billionaire, but they wouldn't do this for me. Why? That's why you have to ask yourself. Why? Because the answer is very, very simple, but nobody wants to admit it. And the answer is, because he's a black man, because they're a Muslim man, a Turkish man, because they're gay, nobody wants to do anything. But if you offend one of our friends, says the DFB, then we'll do something about it. You have to look at yourself long time in the mirror and think, why? And like I said, the answer is staring you right in the face.